scientists, philosophers, epidemiologists, public health experts, and they will tell us about some of the models that have been used for representing the disease and also how to make sense of these models and how should they inform public policy. With that, I invite the first panelist, Dr. Bert Baumgartner. Dr. Baumgartner is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Idaho. His research interests lie in the intersection of philosophy and cognitive and social sciences. Bert is also working on the philosophical foundations of agent-based modeling and is using them to address issues in social epistemology. He has also studied the influence that individual beliefs can have on the course of a disease. Welcome to the panel, Bert. Uh, and I must add that it's rather early at Idaho, so thank, thank, we thank him a lot for agreeing to be with us today. Uh, so, Bert, could you tell us something briefly about what epi epidemic models are? What do they represent? What are some of the kinds of epidemic models that inform our understanding of, of the pandemic? Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, for that great introduction. And great to see uh, a bunch of familiar faces here. Um, so it often what a model is representing depends on the questions that we're asking and that we're interested in. Um, for the kinds of models that I've worked on, they all have some form of the following kind of structure. So I'm going to just briefly share my screen just so that there's an image um, there in front of you as well. Okay, let's get a quick thumbs up to make sure you can see that. Great. So um, these kinds of models are sometimes the most basic versions are sometimes known as SIR models. These are ones where you have individuals that are either susceptible, they're infectious, or they're recovered. And then when you have a model that is trying to model or be able to capture features like vaccination or social distancing or mask wearing, we also include something like this prophylactic group, this P here. And then the complicated questions arise from how do we uh, think about the rates at which people transition between these different um, groups. So some models will make certain assumptions about how the population might be uh, well mixing, right? That people are bumping into each other um, randomly. And uh, those are often, these are called compartmental models, which is uh, typically illustrated in, in this way. But you can also have agent-based models where you explicitly represent individuals and they have these particular kinds of states where there are these, these types of individuals. And then you have different rules in the agent-based model for how an individual who's susceptible would become an infectious individual, depending on whether they bump into another individual in the model or something like that. But most of the models have some form of this kind of structure uh, and the details matter and are really important, but most of them have something that looks like this. Thank you, thank you for that introduction to uh, what epidemic models do or what, uh, how the mechanism, how they go about representing the evolution of the disease. Uh, for the second panelist, we have with us Professor Gautam Menon. Uh, professor Menon is uh, a professor of biology and physics at Ashoka University. He's interested in biophysics, computers and bi biology, and issues in theoretical physics. He has also worked on mathematical computer modeling of infectious diseases. And his writings in popular media have informed the general public about epidemic models. Welcome to the panel, Gautam. Now, you are familiar with some of the different models that have been developed to simulate the evolution of the pandemic in India. Uh, could you tell us something about these models and some of the ways in which they differ from each other? I can do that. Can I share my screen and, and uh, your presentation? Yeah, I had essentially four things to talk about. And the first part of it will be a little bit about models and the models that we work on and what they do. And then I want to talk a little bit about the topic of this, which is really the philosophical and ethical context of these, of thinking along these lines. And it, I just want to say that I usually talk to scientists and modelers and, and other people. And it's such fun to be able to talk about larger implications about what I do. And I really, I think that's it's a very special feeling. I'll tell you a little bit about the models, including models that I work on. And I want to tell you a little bit about ethics and communication, how models influence policy and something called Bharatism, which raises a whole bunch of additional interesting questions, which is related to the whole question of, of, um, of agent-based models that was just discussed. So let's start with models. I work, the group that I work with, which is the Indian Scientist Response to COVID-19, 
has developed fairly complicated models for India at the level of the districts. So you can see all of the 748 districts of India on the top, right? This is a complicated model. You don't need to worry about the details of it, but just, it just tells you how someone who's susceptible to the disease becomes exposed to the disease. They either can be asymptomatically infected, which means they don't show symptoms at all while being capable of infecting other people, or they can either be mildly or severely infected. If they're severely infected, they go to hospital, they can even die. And this is the sort of the, 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 the more complicated version of the model that you just saw. It has much more detail inside it than I'm telling you about all of this. You can divide each of these little boxes by ages. So you account for, for the ages 10 to 20, 30 to 40, 60 to 70, all of them separately, because you know that the disease hits them very differently. You can account for migration, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are complexities that you can put into models. Here's something that models are useful for. And we work, for example, with the, with the administration in Pune. And that little gray band that you see was our prediction for how many people would be hospitalized across basically the last year from starting from about April of May of last year to the current date. You can see that the, the dark spots in there are the points, the actual numbers of people hospitalized, the critical active cases in Pune on those particular dates. This is roughly what a model ought to do for you. It should be able to predict what might happen in the future. It should be able to show you, give you some rationale for what's happening in the past. I just want to point out one interesting feature of this. You'll notice that there's a point at which these points leave the gray area in between. And that's interesting because that's, and then they sort of suddenly plummet back. And what happened there was that the government just found out that many people were in hospital who didn't need to be in hospital, who could be at home. So they didn't fall into the, into the classification of cases that required hospitalization. And so that suddenly comes back into the band that we drew. And that's an interesting question. Was the model right or was the actual data right out to which we fit the model. And that's a, from a philosophical point of view, that's somewhat interesting to think about that. Here's what's been happening in India in the state of India and Karnataka from two weeks ago. And you can see these points are the numbers of cases that are being diagnosed. So what any government wants to do is to try and understand what might happen to this further on. So when we looked at it two weeks ago, our conclusion was that we expected this to go on further downwards. But of course, a model is only useful. It has to be updated every time as more data comes in. And it really doesn't make sense to look at things on a longer period than about two weeks or a week at maximum. So this is the more recent version of that. You can see the, what we predict might happen in the future. And that's connected to the numbers below where we look at the numbers of infections and track what's going as they're going up. And as you know, people both from India and from outside India know that in the Indian cases are slowly increasing. And it does seem as though we may be on the verge of another wave of the disease. And that's something that models can in principle tell you about. The last point I wanted to make was on, on just on the modeling part of it was the fact that if you run models that are a little more complex than the one that I showed you earlier. And if you run them and you run them again and you run them again with slightly different conditions, what you actually get are not these nice smooth lines that you saw in an earlier graph or the one that you see here. You see a whole bunch of possible trajectories and each of this is a potential trajectory that the disease could have taken. And that's where stochasticity enters. And the fact that what happens to a model is at some very, very deep level unpredictable because it could change as a function of completely random events that really are not included in that model at all. So when one thinks about models and has this whole sequence in, in which one works with models that are deterministic, that give you a precise answer, and models that are stochastic, that give you sort of changing numbers. So that's an answer to your question about the model point of view. I do have more, and I can come back to that at some later point, but maybe I should just stop here, Abhishek. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gautam. Uh, and with that, I would like to invite uh, the third panelist and uh, some of the points that he made uh, uh, would actually be helpful to uh, what I would be asking our third panelist. Uh, our third panelist is Dr. Jonathan Fuller. He's an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Fuller is a philosopher of medicine. His research currently has two, two strands, disease and biomedicine, and epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. He has recently studied the metaphysics and classification of contemporary diseases as well as modeling of disease and medical interventions. His work on causal inference, external validity, meta research, and the relationship between population data and individuals in clinical research and epidemiology. Welcome to the panel, John. We heard from Gotham about how different uh, models, they basically have different assumptions and also a lot of information that goes into the making of these models, a lot of uh, uh, information and that can drive how the, uh, drive the evolution of the disease that is represented in these models. Uh, and often they might lead to different conclusion, which crucially would depend on the assumptions that have gone into these models. But given this variety of models and indeed variety of approaches to representing the pandemic, 
what can we really say about the public policy that is guided by these models? Is there a trade-off that we have to keep in mind when we are, like, for example, talking about how reliable a model is to how easy it is to arrive at uh, its predictions? Yeah, thanks so much, Abhishek. Um, yeah, I think there's no easy answer to your question. Maybe I'll start off by pointing out that um, Bert and uh, Gautam very uh, helpfully talked about one particular kind of model that's very commonly used in the pandemic, and that's a compartment model. Um, the behavioral scientist Jimmy Adams and several other people find different ways of dividing up the kinds of models that are sometimes used to represent what goes on in an epidemic. Um, and one parsing of the different kinds of models I find useful is that there are these compartment models, which actually are quite old. Um, they've been developed over time, but the original versions are 100 years old. They're equation based um, and they allow us to track things at a, at a kind of abstract population level. Within compartments, we assume that people are mixing um, homogeneously commonly. But there are different kinds of models, including ones that have come along in more recent decades. Uh, one of these types is a micro simulation model, sometimes called agent based, depending on uh, the details of the model. And this looks at things at the more individual level, um, and often includes more detail, um, therefore requires a bit more information and tracks the movements, contacts and status of individuals in a population over time, including as they as individuals transition from being susceptible to infectious to recovered and so on. And then finally, uh, another kind, uh, kind of model that Adams and other scientists sometimes talk about are more data-driven um, and less theoretical. So these are models that use statistics in order to plot a, a curve onto a data set and then use that curve in order to make predictions about that setting or perhaps a different setting. So different models build in different assumptions they look at the population differently. So compartment models take a kind of bird's eye view, micro simulation models take an individual level view, and also different models may be more theoretical or more statistical. Um, because of this division between the more theoretical and statistical ones, some might be more transparent and provide us with explanations. They might allow us to understand why, for instance, a curve that was previously on an upward slope suddenly plateaued and decreased. We can come up with potential reasons that point to um, factors such as rates of contact um, and so on. And other curves aren't able, other kinds of models aren't able to necessarily do that. More data-driven curves might be, be might be okay for predicting, but might be a bit more opaque to someone who wants to understand what's going on. And at the same time, because they take a slightly different approach to modeling, they might have different limitations as well as different virtues. I won't get into too many of the uh, perhaps virtues and limitations here, because I think that's something maybe we can explore during the question period. But I think that, you know, I think on the one hand, it's a mistake to kind of pit these different models against each other and to ask which is the universal best. Because they all each have their specific uses and limitations, we have to first ask what kinds of questions do we want answered, what kinds of data are available to us now, and which kind of model will do the right job for us to answer this question. But also, we don't have to choose necessarily from one model or another. So different countries have often come up with these ensembles of models, pooling together different kinds of models, trying to figure out where and how their predictions diverge, and sometimes coming up with a more either consensus estimate or more usefully, I think, range of estimates that helps us to chart out the space of possibilities we can expect given the different models and their divergent predictions. So it's not which model is the best necessarily, but how can different models inform us in different contexts? And indeed, how can we bring them together in order to, to fill in a more um, rich picture about what we can expect to happen? Thank you, John. Uh, it would be great to return to this point and uh, ask you about uh, how do we make use of these different types of models to inform public policy? Uh, but before that, I turn to our fourth panelist, Dr. Sunita Krishnan. Uh, Dr. Krishnan is a public health researcher with over 15 years of experience conducting research and engaging with policymakers on the promotion of health and social equity, with a focus on India. By on the theories and tools of social epidemiology, biostatistics and medical anthropology, she has studied the pathways through which poverty, gender, and other social inequities lead to adverse health outcomes. 
She is presently the country lead of measurement at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the office. Among her other activities, she is supporting the application and implementation of science to deepen understanding of intervention effectiveness, uptake, scale up, and sustainability. She is also establishing measurement frameworks and evaluation of initiatives focused on promoting evidence-based policy making and broad-based social and behavioral change. Welcome to the panel, Sunita. Now, we we heard John tell us about uh, the fact that uh, it's a misguided question to talk about uh, which model is really the best. When really we should be asking is whether or not this model is useful for this particular uh, purpose. Uh, but despite that, it seems that one of the most important things, as it were, is to really validate these models to see whether these models really represent uh, something or the predictions really match up with what is something that we uh, see in the world. And that brings to the question of the data that we have many times for validating these models. Now, in the context of India, uh, it seems that collection of data by groups of researchers or even by institutions is not always easy. And you have worked a bit on facilitating the, the access to data between organizations and groups of researchers. So we're hoping that you could probably tell us something about that. Sure, thank you so much. I'm definitely the, uh, the uh, uh, interloper here. Uh, the, <laughs> um, I haven't really formally studied much philosophy except in the context of my training in medical anthropology. Um, but uh, I do ponder on philosophical questions in the context of my work. So as a practitioner, um, yes. So the, um, you know, a lot of the work that I do at the Gates Foundation is in support of um, the social science research community. So I do have colleagues who are, you know, working with Gautam and supporting modeling exercises, working on clinical trials and so on. But my practice is primarily oriented towards generating um, information, data, insights, evidence from the community and through social science research methods. And the social science research community rallied in the context of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And in late March, as the very stringent lockdown was being imposed in India, a number of uh, researchers sort of came forward um, to, uh, you know, sort of, um, to us and to other philanthropies uh, within the country to repurpose existing projects and studies that they have to examine the impact of the lockdown and COVID on lives and livelihoods in India. Uh, you know, these are researchers who had established panels who were um, experimenting with using mobile phones to do data collection, um, other kinds of online um, data collection methods. And so they were, you know, they already had access to communities. They were already in touch with households across many states of India um, and were in a position to actually now start to do research to understand in real time how people were experiencing the pandemic. And the speed with which these studies were repurposed and sort of went back into the field was such that um, you know, many of the questions that we think about. Um, you know, in normal times, really, there was no time to sit and ponder over those questions in terms of, you know, um, what are the pros and cons of these modes of data collection um, that we're going to use? Who's going to be included? Who, importantly, is going to be excluded from these data collection methods? How are we going to pay attention and how are we going to operationalize you know, basic principles of research ethics in terms of how we obtain informed consent, how do we, um, you know, protect people's privacy and confidentiality, um, how are we going to, in turn, also, you know, promote the use of the evidence that comes out of this so that, um, you know, when people are, um, you know, volunteering their time in the midst of a certain amount of distress that there is benefit that arises from the time that they're contributing, right? So all of these questions were, you know, percolating within the, the research community, but really everybody felt under huge pressure to also go into the field quickly and to generate um, data. Um, so the Gates Foundation 
colleagues, uh, you know, myself and other colleagues, along with other um, Indian philanthropies, including the Omidyar Network, we decided to bring researchers um, together as part of a roundtable. This was on the 9th of April. All these days are like seared in memory. Um, you know, it was such an intense period of time. Uh, so we gathered together on the 9th of April to figure out how are we going to, you know, move forward as a community? How will we, you know, start to actually um, ensure that there's certain standards, certain, um, you know, practices that we, act, we maintain that we develop newly in the context of the pandemic for um, you know, uh, generating social science insights. And I'll talk a little bit about you know, uh, the, the specific, specific dilemmas um, and, and then standards and guidelines that we did go on to develop. We, we established this community called CoreNet. We have over 150 members, over 50 organizations engaging in social science research across the country. And we met on a weekly basis for many, many months. And Gautam was one of our guests at our weekly coffee hour to tell us about the modeling he's using. Um, the idea though of the network was also to see if we could generate data in a coherent way and actually get data to flow you know, to flow within the community and also to flow to scientists like Gautam who are engaging in these modeling exercises and needed empirical estimates, uh, you know, for various parameters that they're using in their model, um, as well as to flow back, um, importantly, to civil society groups who are engaging in the pandemic response, as well as to government decision makers. And, you know, what we have sort of um, reflected on at the end of now a year almost of working together is that we did pretty well in terms of, you know, coming together, helping each other decide what were the important questions to ask? How would we complement each other's research activities so that we, we didn't have, you know, unnecessary redundancies that we were actually using our research resources in an optimal way to generate data. But we didn't really get to the data flow issues um, very much. And the data flow issues are, you know, fairly complicated. And I'll just share with you five sort of challenges that we've identified that we're in the process now of working through that have implications for the modeling work that Gautam and others are describing. Um, so to unlock data, what we discovered is that we need to be able to articulate clear value propositions for data sharing and collaboration. Um, you know, people need to understand and, and be convinced that making data flow, sharing data, making data more open uh, will actually lead to benefits, to concrete goods, um, and will not backfire on them in some fashion. And related to that, you know, there are concerns um, arising from questions around data ownership and sharing that members of our community have raised. What are the conditions under which the data were originally obtained? And do those sort of agreements and conditions um, allow one to make data more available, um, you know, to share data? What were the agreements uh, around the informed consent process, for example? Also, what are the implications um, of impending um, data privacy and security laws that are being framed or that have already been framed uh, in different parts of the world? heard there were um, concerns related to data use. What kinds of reuse of data are acceptable given the origins of the data? What prevention and mitigation measures can be put in place to avoid data misuse and data misinterpretation? Fourth um, is ensuring adequate data documentation and standards to facilitate pooling and reuse. I mean, this is a very basic problem. It isn't necessarily one related to the pandemic, but you know, people use many different definitions, uh, you know, for for particular concepts and and, and variables and so on across studies. Um, you know, there are standards issues or standardization issues arising right from how you construct questionnaires. Um, and lastly, you know, I think there, there's a recognition that we need to evolve good practices re related to output dissemination. How do we attribute, uh, you know, where the data have come from? How do we ensure that those who have contributed to those data, um, the generation of the data, the, analy uh, the analysis of data, um, how, how do we ensure that they actually can participate in the production of insights and outputs such as publications, et cetera? Um, so how do we really, you know, sort of work together as a community um, and ensure that different kinds of contributions are equally valued? Um, so these are some of the, the questions that we've been grappling with as empirical research, you know, researchers. Um, 
that I think have implications for the modeling community. So let me pause there. Thank you. Uh, it seems uh, very important, uh, I guess, to all of us uh, to keep this in mind that uh, it's not just, I mean, when we are talking about modeling and uh, academic, it's not just about coming up with the uh, most useful or uh, let's say the model that best fits the data. Uh, there are logic concerns about where we get this data in the first place and what we can do to the people who have, uh, who have been engaged in, in this uh, activity of collecting the data. Uh, and we will probably get to hear more uh, from you on this. Uh, on especially on the ethical aspects of uh, collecting the data. Uh, but first, let us turn to the modeling aspect of this, this whole exercise. It's, I mean, the model set, it seems that we discussed till now, uh, compartment models, they assume certain homogeneity in the population. And it's, it does not seem that it actually is the case in, 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 in real life. Uh, so the, the modelers, they introduce some qualifications so, for example, they might want to say that a particular section of the population is more susceptible to the disease than the others, and then try to incorporate them in the model to see how uh, the progression of the disease goes. Uh, Doctor uh, Professor Gautam Menon has worked some on, on this on this aspect. He has studied how genetic factors increase the susceptibility to disease, and he has been able to incorporate these for a different disease for influenza trying to assess the, the, the growth of uh, the spread of a disease. So Dr. Uh, Professor Menon, could you please speak a bit on, uh, on how do we go about incorporating these aspects uh, which are specific to populations in our epidemiological models? I could do that, but let me just share a few slides that relate to this question and then I'll come back to the specific question. I think it's important in the context of what Sunita mentioned just now, or where exactly you assimilate different types of data. So that will expand the discussion a little bit. Let me just go back to seeing if I can project my slides again. Okay, so I want to tell you about a project called Bharat Sim that really is relevant to both what Sunita talked about in a broader sense, as well as to the question of how do we incorporate information, like genetic information of the sort that you described. The quick answer to your question is that for, for COVID-19, we don't know the sort of genetic determinants that might protect against it or that might be useful against it. So at this stage, we're not in a position to put them into our models. Hopefully a year or two down the line, we'll be no more. But of course, by then probably COVID-19 may not be the sort of urgent problem that it is now. We'll be in a better position to put it in. So Bharat Sim is a simulation of what are called agents. Agent-based modeling was referred to a little earlier. And the agent-based model is the most granular way of describing how diseases move between people. Here you simulate on a computer every person that you can think about in the community, in a city, in a state, in a country. So Bharat Sim was designed or was originally conceptualized as a way of simulating the 1.38 billion people in India because that's a tall order. So we'd be perfectly happy with a much more limited simulating Delhi, for example, or the state of Maharashtra. The sort of complexities that we want to put in it are the homes where people live in, the workplaces where they work, the schools where children go to, and the nature of the networks in each of these places. So there are two main components to Bharat Sam. As I said, this is an ultra large scale simulation of agents. So one part is the purely computational part where you want to simulate, write a computer program that simulates agents and does it fast. Because by the time you get to 1.38 billion, it's time is really a constraint. It's not so much writing the program. But the second part is the one that I want to draw your attention to, and that's a synthetic population. And that raises very interesting philosophical questions for me. So let me tell you what a synthetic population is. A synthetic population is just something that describes the people which enter your simulation. And ideally what you might want is something that you enables you to integrate multiple data sources, multiple surveys, for example, gender, age, family sizes, socioeconomic data, healthcare access, education, et cetera, to define each little person in your computational model. So you might have a family of four, the child is going to school, the mother is, is a homemaker, the father is, is an agricultural laborer, et cetera. You want to put that level of granularity inside. If you have more information, for example, if you have information about uh, pre-existing conditions, if you have information about genetic susceptibilities to COVID-19, you could put that in, in, in as well. The idea behind a synthetic population is that at some level it should be indistinguishable from what from survey data. If someone actually went out and surveyed your population, the better your synthetic population was, the more accurately you might be able to predict the results of that particular survey. So there are many questions here. And to one question, of course, is a practical question. To what extent 
Can you make more granular your descriptions of the population? And, and you started off with just dumb compartments where everyone is susceptible or infected, etc. But now you're looking at the level of individual people with all of the complexities that you need to describe an individual person and how disease might spread. This is not useful just for disease. You can ask a whole bunch of questions that relate to social interactions, the effects of various types of decisions that people make. Because the idea of an agent is an agent is something that can change its behavior depending upon its context, and you can implement that on a computer. The philosophical question here is what is a good synthetic population? In a sense, you know, if you actually went and asked someone to write down every detail about themselves, you could translate that and that would be the synthetic population. We don't want to do that. We want to integrate information from a multiple sources. So it's almost correct, but it's not quite correct. The, the synthetic individual doesn't really describe any single individual in a population. It's just at a statistical level, you can, you can hope to get away with, 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 what, with your description and hope to be able to answer these sort of granular questions. There are other types of philosophical and more ethical issues. To, if you have an extremely accurate synthetic population, you can ask questions that you hope people would not want to ask. Where do people stay who belong to a particular community or a particular class? How are they geographically distributed? What is the correlation between socioeconomic class, income, interactions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So there is a level at which you should stop making your synthetic population as accurate as possible, even though in a sort of scientific sense, you might want to be as accurate as possible. So for me, this, this raises extremely interesting ethical questions of what, how good should a synthetic population be? Where should you stop? What are the uses of this in a positive sense and being, being able to understand disease spread at a more granular level? But okay, so let me just stop there with that very quick summary of, 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 of and I hope I answered the question at least in some part. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so one of the ways it seems that uh, in which, uh, by which we can uh, incorporate these uh, specific aspects of individuals is by doing uh, what you suggest uh, uh, using agent-based modeling and de defining what the synthetic individual is. Uh, now, the evolution of a pandemic, apart from how susceptible the population is, how infectious the disease is, it also depends on what the behavioral patterns of the population are. Uh, and on this, uh, I would want to uh, ask uh, Bert to tell us about, uh, about his work in which he tries to incorporate these behavioral patterns in understanding how a, a disease could progress. I'm sorry, I just missed the last part of your question. Could you just repeat that one more time? Yes, uh, I, was, I was hoping that you could tell us uh, about your work in which you incorporate these behavioral aspects in understanding how a disease uh, evolves. How pandemic focuses. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we have worked on is trying to think about how to represent the behavior in the simplest way possible to make the model as tractable as possible. So Gautam's case is, is a really interesting one, right? There you're trying to figure out how granular can we go. And a lot of work that we've tried to do is like, how little granular can we do, get, get away with, but still represent the, the behavior because we wanna to try to keep the models as simple as possible. And there's an interesting compare and contrast that you can then do, right, between those two types of models. So one thing that we have tried to do is think about how to represent that behavior, at least in the compartmental model kind of context by having a separate type of compartment that represents people who are engaging in that kind of prophylactic behavior. And then what we try to do is understand what are the various kinds of contexts or conditions that um, inform how people decide to engage in certain kinds of uh, behaviors. And one of the things that has been really interesting is trying to understand the role of social influence um, on people's decisions to engage in certain behaviors. So I think this raises uh, sort of two points. One is a methodological point. And one is just a, a broader point about how we are now modeling diseases in ways that are very different than we have in the past. The methodological point that I want to make is modelers often distinguish between um, the notion of idealization versus abstraction. So in the case of abstraction, you just simply ignore something that you think is not at all relevant to the questions that you're asking. So the example that I will sometimes give is, if you're interested in modeling the orbits of planets, you don't really care what color they are. So you just completely disregard uh, questions about color. In Gautam's example, right, uh, I favor, people's favorite ice cream flavor probably has nothing to do with disease, right? So you just completely uh, ignore that. Contrast that with idealization. Idealization is 
usually incorporating some kind of information, but you're doing it in some informed but false way. So again, thinking about the orbits of planets, right? A real planet has some kind of extension, but if you're calculating its orbits, that extension doesn't really matter as much. All you care about is its mass. And then you represent that mass as sitting in a single point. So that's a falsification, right? But it's still including that kind of information in it. In the case of disease models, right? One thing that we might do is collapse considerations about how a disease spreads. So you know there has to be some kind of contact event. We know there has to be some duration of that contact event. And we know there has to be some kind of probability of the disease transmitting in that event. But in some compartmental models, we just collapse all that into a single parameter value. And so there we can still get out some information about things about like contact rates, but sometimes we might not be able to do a more fine grained distinction like you might in an aging based model like Gautam works on where you usually explicitly represent those three different kinds of components separately. So the advantage you get uh, in that idealization is a model that you don't need to have uh, as, as much simulation power to do it, right? It's something that you can maybe even in the ideal case, like write out by, uh, by hand. So there's an advantage uh, there for that. Um, so with respect to then the, the, not the methodological point, but the second point is what we've tried to do is understand what are some of the uh, things that guide people's decisions. And we've been really interested in the role of social influence. And in the United States, one of the things that we've looked at is the emergence, re-emergence of uh, vaccine hesitancy. So vaccine hesitancy is something that has emerged um, uh, more recently. Again, it's, not, it's, it's an older thing. It, it's been around for, for, for quite some time, but we've really seen it grow in the, in the US, especially with the measles outbreaks. And what we find that I think is really interesting is that we can discover that different sociodemographic variables seem to predict people's willingness to engage not just in uh, vaccination, but as well as like face mask wearing. So we think that there's a sort of broader behavioral kind of uh, group that includes a bunch of these things that we think we can predict using some sociodemographic features. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that the more extreme people tend to be ideologically, the more sort of set they are in that kind of behavior that they're willing to engage in. Whereas those individuals who are less uh, set ideologically seem to respond the most flexibly according to various kinds of conditions. So when risk is really low, they tend to behave like all the others who would be skeptical. But as risk gets dialed up, they seem to like really be responsive to that and then engage in something like social distancing or, or mask wearing a lot more. And so we're really interested in trying to figure out those sociodemographic predictors and then include that as simply as possible into some of the types of compartmental models that we've been doing. Thank you. That was really informative. Uh, uh, it was really good uh, great to know that it is possible to incorporate uh, uh, these behaviors, which can be predicted by your identity in a social group, to really drive uh, a better understanding of how how diseases uh, progress. Probably the other way in which identifying with a social group uh, influences uh, how susceptible you are to a particular disease if this particular social group happens to be a disadvantaged group. So depending on, so the, why the compartmental model might assume a certain degree of homogeneity might just uh, show that, okay, in a particular sample, this is, these are the number of cases that we expect. It might not really capture the fact that uh, like certain groups they tend to disproportionately be represented in, in both the, uh, the people who are affected and the people who stand to lose because of the effects of the pandemic. Uh, so I guess, over here, what we need is probably an insight from social epidemiology, which talks about how certain social structural factors also influence our access to healthcare. I was uh, hoping uh, Sunita could tell us a bit about how, uh, how social epidemiology can guide our thinking about the pandemic using models like uh, the ones that they have been talking about. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Abhishek, uh, for, for that question. Um, you know, I think what we've seen, um, I mean, across the world, we've seen enormous heterogeneity in the practice of an adherence to non-pharmaceutical interventions, right, such as mask use and physical distancing. We've certainly seen an enormous amount of uh, heterogeneity in the U.S. Um, 
uh, I uh, was born and grew up in the U.S. and my daughter studies in the U.S. So I, I follow U.S. politics and uh, what's going on with the pandemic in the U.S. very, very closely. Um, and we've seen, um, you know, we've seen across the world that uh, these behaviors, um, you know, vary uh, as, as Bert was saying uh, within population subgroups and, and India is no exception. Um, what I think we have observed, um, particularly in India, uh, during the context of this pandemic, is that individuals who live in precarious economic circumstances, you know, for whom livelihoods and subsistence require them to be on the front lines or, you know, um, to be frankly just plainly exposed, the kinds of calculations that we're talking about are not ones that they can make. Right, that they have the agency really to be making, um, and 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 you know fundamentally, and we've seen this in the U.S. as well, right, amongst minority groups, among groups of you know frontline workers, sanitation workers, our subway workers, and in in New York and so on. These are populations that um, you know don't really have the luxury of choice. Um, such as you and I. I mean, I've been sitting in this corner, I've been dressing it up with, you know, my family's artwork and so on. And, you know, a lot of the people that certainly the foundation works with do not have that choice. And um, the pandemic has really underscored the need for the public health community, including government, development partners and philanthropies uh, like Gates, um, as well as researchers to really be zeroing in on who is the most vulnerable, who might be the most vulnerable as this pandemic um, you know, evolves, whose lives are the most precarious. So for example, one of the insights that came out of um, research done by one of our partners, the National Council for Applied Economic Research here in Delhi, which, did, um, which had a panel of households that they had been following um, from about a year and a half before the pandemic, um, in the, in the larger Delhi metropolitan area. So it includes both urban as well as rural households in, in the NCR region. Um, what we discovered through their um, surveys was that there was this you know, new group of highly vulnerable families. These are urban families or sort of just living right on the edge of poverty, uh, you know, who in the best of times were doing fairly well um, you know, in informal work in the cities, but as soon as lockdown hit, their livelihoods were drastically affected. Now, the entire social security system in India has really been focused on securing uh, rural, vulnerable and poor households. And so those social safety nets weren't available, they weren't working for these urban households. Uh, we also saw everybody across the world saw the huge migration of, you know, individuals from, from urban areas back to rural areas over the first few months of lockdown. Again, another source of vulnerability that we hadn't adequately um, recognized from a policy perspective. And um, it's not clear to me exactly how the modeling, um, you know, may have dealt with that because those, these are all emergent issues. You know, we're working in this really complex, um, you know, we're essentially in, in a complex adaptive system. And so some of these, uh, these, you know, are emergent properties of that system. Um, and so I don't think we could have really predicted um, a lot of that, uh, but I think it will be really interesting to see how we can feed back into the models, these you know new insights on the drivers of vulnerability and who's vulnerable. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sunita. Uh, on this point, uh, I think I would like to uh, invite uh, John. What he was talking about a bit earlier about the uh, possibility of using different kinds of models to uh, in an ensemble to kind of inform public policy. So we have heard about different types of models, the kind of uh, so behavioral cues, genetic factors, et cetera, that they incorporate. And we have also heard from Sunita how different populations are susceptible or more susceptible than others to the effects of the pandemic, to the effects of the disease. So could you tell us a bit on how do policymakers go about making sense of all these different types of models and also the fact that they know ahead that certain groups of population are more susceptible than the others? Yeah, thanks, Abhishek. So, I mean, first, I should say that I'm not myself a policymaker. 
Um, so everything I say should be taken with that caveat in mind. I did train in medicine. Um, however, I've come to realize over the past number of years, and especially the past year, that medical decision-making and medical thinking is very different than the kinds of thinking that we need to do in public health as public health policymakers. And I actually think that some problems, disagreements, clashes have occurred precisely because public health is such an interdisciplinary field. A pandemic is such a multifaceted problem and different kinds of scientists who bring with them their own preferred theories, methods, and assumptions have often, have often or maybe not often, but sometimes come into conflict um, with respect to how they view the reliability of models versus, versus other kinds of information and so on. Um, so I, I tend to think about I tend to think about public health decision making as a context in which there's a diversity of kinds of information, and the challenge is to figure out how to bring it all to bear on a single question. However, on the other hand, in the first context I was talking about medical decision making, a kind of approach has has arisen over the past number of decades within the movement that's known as evidence based medicine that doesn't really think about the problem quite that way. Um, so, so the rhetoric of evidence-based medicine is more you know, evidence, quality, and best decisions being, being based on the best quality evidence we have. In public health decision-making, you know, policymakers don't often have the luxury of waiting for the best high quality evidence we could ever hope for. They have to make do with the kind of information that they have. In that sense, I think public health decision-making is a little bit more pragmatic by necessity and has evolved or developed the ability to kind of think about how to harness the, the mo all the data we have and get the most amount of action actionable information out of that data and out of those models. When you're thinking about, let's say in a medical context, uh, you know, preventing a complication of a chronic disease that's gonna be with you for some time. Um, and the intervention question is a medication that people might be taking for for years and um, the benefits are measured in, in terms of preventing you know, a few deaths in the order of magnitude out of, a, out of 100, 100 people. Um, you can kind of afford to wait, do a high quality study like a randomized trial and, and generate the kind of high quality evidence that you could then rely on for years and years and decades. In a situation like a pandemic, a fast moving situation, you need to, to get data quickly and you need to generate recommendations that are available to us now and not in 10 years. So the contexts are very different. And I think sometimes bringing that former perspective that we're used to in medicine to bear in public health questions can lead us astray because we don't have time to wait for evidence that we may never be able to generate in the first place. So this leaves a kind of really interesting to my mind problem about how do we integrate very different kinds of information that epidemiologists and public health people have available to them. On the one hand, we have you know, all sorts of population studies, you know, case studies, uh, natural experiments as different parts of the world undertake different uh, interventions. On the other hand, we have the kind of information that basic scientists generate in the lab, virologists studying the virus, um, geneticists studying the evolution of the virus, uh, more biologically based research that's equally relevant to understanding the pandemic and how it's going to evolve. We have more mathematically minded people producing models that are highly abstract and theoretical and that don't always just predict what exactly is going to happen, but rather what could happen under a range of possible scenarios. And the really tough question, which I frankly just don't have an answer to is how we actually bring together all these different kinds of information to answer a, a particular problem. I think we do it. I think we do it sometimes very well but I think one thing that we that um, we could say about this process is that it involves rather harnessing the various kinds of information that different pieces of research science offer that are non-redundant. So it's not the case that we have you know a model in a natural experiment and a laboratory experiment that are all telling us the same thing. They're all, you know they're not all just evaluating, let's say, the effectiveness of mask wearing for preventing transmission. Rather, they're giving us different pieces of an overall puzzle that we have to put together. Now, I, I say we very generously, I'm not including myself in this, in this uh, process because I'm not a policymaker. The policymakers have to figure out how to put together these pieces of information, which is a very different kind of reasoning and decision-making 
um, than I think I was used to as somebody who trained in evidence-based medicine. So I think this presents lots of interesting problems for philosophers of science around how to synthesize and aggregate evidence and how to make decisions in a context in which the evidence might be, uh, and the kind of information we have might be highly fallible. And um, rather than trying to figure out which is more reliable, we have to rather figure out how to bring together this very diverse um, and sometimes discordant range of evidence in order to make a decision. I think epidemiology and public health are really a nice model for thinking about that very difficult problem. And I think it's a both a practically uh, important one, but also a very interesting one for philosophy of science. Uh, Sunita, please, please go ahead. Yeah, just, I mean, everything that Jonathan said really resonated. And I think what, um, you know, I, and, and many others that I was working with, um, you know, sort of grappled with, struggled with all through last year was sort of the decision, for example, of the government of India to, you know, put into place this very stringent lockdown. And there was a lot of debate over, you know, whether India should have made that kind of a decision. You know, this is the kind of decision that high income countries are taking, but low and middle income countries like us really don't have the luxury, you know, to, uh, you know, all go back and sit in our homes, et cetera. But, you know, there were so many factors at play, you know, I mean, it, it does, is life so cheap here that we, you know, knowing what we knew at that point in time, which was not very much, right? It could have been far more fatal than it, than it has ended up being, at least in India from as far as we know. But, you know, it, 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 well, it, are we willing to pay that price? Are we willing to pay the cost? I mean, I wasn't willing to step out of my, literally my apartment, you know, um, my life meant too much to me. Um, and so, you know, I think there, there are these, the, the, these questions that I think are worth debating. And, and I have been somewhat disappointed that we, you know, haven't had sort of a more reasoned sort of systematic and philosophical debate. You know, I feel like we've had a highly politicized, you know, an emotional debate about this issue. So anyway, just wanted to say that everything you said really resonated. Thank you. Adam, please go ahead. Yeah, no, again, it's what, what Jonathan said about integrating information together and what Sunita expanded on. The whole question of how many lives were saved by the pandemic has been a very political question in India. And you had sort of people very high up in the political framework presenting results that said that by locking down, India saved 100,000 lives or 200,000 lives at this time. And had we, had we locked down two weeks later, that number would have been different. So, you know, we did this too in some level. And then we realized that this is a mugs game because it all depends upon what you put into that calculation. Because this person did not die of COVID-19, but they could have died of 20 other things which were precipitated by the pandemic, by the lockdown. So these are questions that at, a, in, at some level are not really answerable and we shouldn't really get into them. And they're, they're extremely delicate. It depends upon what you choose to count, what you choose to leave out. And unless your modeler is prepared to explain to you everything that they did to put in and engage with you about this whole question. So let me just finish with one particular quote that I heard, which struck me very deeply at the beginning of the pandemic in India and when the cold question of the lockdown came in. And that was, I think, a, a laborer who was, who was locked under lockdown and was away, unable to get back home because all of public transport and long distance transport had shut down. He said, look, we can choose either to die of COVID-19 or we can die of starvation. And at some elemental level, that really is the question in an LMIC country that you, the, the rules that are important here, the, the variables that have to be taken into account in this whole fog of war situation where very, how you should move forward is unclear, what might unfold, even the basic parameters of the disease are unclear. And that I think is an important thing to keep in mind for policy, for philosophy, that the, the, the very large dimensions that, that are in a sense peculiar to low income context may not generalize to, may not be generalizable from high income context. And there's much that we need to keep in mind in when we think about these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think that question that you asked Abhishek of Jonathan is probably one of the hardest questions that I've seen asked. I thought Jonathan did an excellent job um, doing his best to, to answer that. And I wanna pick up on what uh, Gautam was just responding to as well. Um, especially earlier on in the pandemic, one, one of our, our biggest concerns here was um, thinking about how it might be possible to avoid the politicalization of some of these decision makings. We've seen this, for example, in the United States for 
various kinds of vaccines that have to do with reproductive issues, that as soon as they get politicized, you see a dramatic difference in the kinds of populations that pick up on the, the vaccines as opposed to not. Um, but as time has gone on, um, one of the things that I have found to be really difficult is, is while we want it not to be politic politicized, I don't think it's I don't think that's avoidable at all. And not just for practical reasons, I think because the very nature of what we deem to be as important is different for different populations that is reflected in the political process, right? So the way that we were just talking about this, that one individual might think that the economics um, in their daily lives is higher and they're willing to take the risk of getting sick and perhaps getting bad symptoms. Whereas others have a different set of values. They say, no, you know what? I'm much more risk averse. And so I, I'm not willing to engage in those kinds of behaviors, even if that has a certain economic cost to me. And those values are precisely the values that usually rise to the level of politics. And so if that's right, then uh, as far as I can tell, there's no way to avoid the politicalization of uh, something like uh, the pandemic that we're experiencing. So I don't have a solution. I'm just creating more problems, I guess, and questions here. Um, but I just want to reflect on, on some of the answers that we just saw for, from Jonathan's response. I guess that's very interesting when you talk about values, because while uh, we think that we can get a lot of information about, uh, say, the mechanism of uh, how the disease progresses using the models, the decisions that we make based on those models have to be also in, kind of informed that the values that we hold like, as a society. Uh, I mean, I, I, as you are saying, these are kind of difficult questions, but I would still want to probably uh, elicit a response uh, uh, on the, on the question that I want to ask next, and I want all of you to probably have a go at it. Now that uh, optimistically we are uh, reaching towards the end of the pandemic, if I can say that, uh, how's, how would it be possible to assess, let's say, the effectiveness of the different measures that we have taken? These are counterfactual scenarios, but can we do it in a manner not to kind of inform the readiness of our healthcare system for such future events? Uh, John, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Abhishek. I want to I respond to that question and also the great comments from the other three just now. So, I mean, just to pick up on a couple things that, um, uh, first of all, that, that Gotham was mentioning. So I, I absolutely agree that I think there really is no single answer to questions like um, how many people have died from COVID-19 and how effective are our policies. I don't want to, so I'm not, Saying that, I don't want to commit myself to a kind of relativism or post-fact, post-truthism. What, what, what I mean is that it really depends on what we, how we define, let's say, a COVID-19 death, and what is the comparison when we're determining the effectiveness of an intervention. To, I, I think go nicely touched on the first, so let me just focus on the second for a, a moment. Um, you know, early on the, in the pandemic, um, one of the most dramatic and, and initial model modeling projections including about different parts of the world, came from the MRC group at Imperial College London. Uh, March 26th, they used an SEIR compartment model to predict um, the course of the epidemic or the pandemic in uh, over 200 countries. And they came up with this bottom line projection that uh, almost 40 million lives, you know, just under 39 million lives would be saved by aggressive viral suppression strategies implemented by every country in the world that they were modeling compared to an unmitigated pandemic scenario. Therefore concluding that these viral suppression strategies had would save or were as effective as almost 39 million lives. This requires a particular choice though. It requires comparing that strategy to an unmitigated pandemic in which nobody changes their behavior and everybody goes on like it was before. If we compare that scenario, the viral, viral the so the kind of aggressive viral suppression strategy to a different scenario, we come up with a different difference. So when we're assessing effectiveness, we always need a, a comparison group. In a, in a model, we just do this by changing parameters. In an epidemiological study, we do this by choosing an actual group to compare the index group to. And, if, and things can look more or less effective based on the comparison that we choose. There are so many choices that go into presenting the effectiveness of an intervention, quantifying the number of deaths or lives saved from an intervention, this really creates an opportunity for different groups that have a prior preference for what we should do to present their case um, by picking particular measures. So if you, if you are a fan of some of the interventions that people have, have taken on, one might point to the more dramatic 
modeling results and say, look at the millions of lives saved by these interventions. On the other hand, if you have a prior preference against certain kinds of policies or interventions that have been undertaken, you can choose to focus on very different comparisons or even very different metrics. Hey, look at the number of people that are now employed, unemployed, living below the poverty line that have been displaced or whatnot. Um, and by focusing on just very, very specific and particular pieces of the puzzle, you can kind of argue your own political position. And this unfortunately is what we've seen happen. Rather than looking at everything at once, which is a very difficult thing to do, obviously, um, certain people have pointed to particular metrics in order to make their case. So this is, I think, a, a, a challenge and problem with having so much information and so many different ways of parsing the problem, unfortunately. But it also raises the question that you just did, Abhishek, around the role of values. And I think we'd all recognize that, that, that making decisions requires not just data, evidence, or models, but also values. Um, that's perhaps um, so obvious to some of us to not even worth, be worth stating. But I think something else that may be less appreciated is that generating evidence and modeling also actually requires values because there's so many choices that go into modeling and evidence. And those choices are not just constrained only by purely what you might call scientific um, factors. In order, to in order to model the effects of a certain intervention, you have to choose what kind of interventions you're even gonna consider in the first place. Um, you know, we didn't choose to model taking people who had the disease and sending them up into space on a, on a rocket ship for various reasons. We did simulate some very other dramatic measures though. And that at least represented a kind of prior commitment to the idea that we might actually consider following through with these kinds of measures if the model suggests that they might be worthwhile. Um, we didn't choose to model everything. We didn't choose to parse the problem initially based on different socioeconomic groups, and whatnot, by choosing what comparisons to make and what interventions to actually model, we're making a prior choice that is already influenced by values itself. So I think values, values are operative in both stages, at the stage where we're actually making a decision as policymakers, but also when we're doing the science itself. I am you on mute. Sorry, I just saw that. Yeah, I, I was wondering if the other panelists also have something to say on, uh, on the values that go into determining our response to the pandemic, but also the models that we design and the variables that we are interested in studying. I mean, that's a great answer. I don't think I could improve on that answer at all. It's, I just wanted to sort of draw attention to a different part of your question where you said, we hope that the pandemic is on its downswing. That's a very hard point to answer at this point. And even that is itself a political question. So there are groups in India who say that we've passed, we are very close to herd immunity and 60% of India has already been infected. We don't believe those numbers. We think there's at least about 20 to 30% more who have to be infected before the pandemic can run its course through, through, uh, through infection of other people. And this, so th this has led to a sort of dichotomy where people who want, would want to support the idea that the government did its best, everything is under control, vaccinations have been rolled out, are in conflict with people who say that, look, as far as we can tell from our models, there are still lots of people to be infected. And the increase we see may be a precursor to a larger wave that could even be larger than the previous wave that we saw. Um, so, no, I, so there is, in a sense, exactly as Jonathan pointed out, the politics that you prefer or the ideas, what you would like to see, in a sense, influences, I think, at least for some groups, what what uh, the, the, the view of what might actually happen. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe I can build on um, Jonathan and Gautam's response, you know, as you were introducing the, the, the session as being one on representation, I was thinking about, you know, the fact that, um, you know, as a social science, you know, member of the social science research community in India, we really struggled with this issue of representation, you know, from, um, you know, the methods that we were using to generate evidence from this very, very critical issue that we kept debating on who are we excluding through, you know, um, the, the research that we were doing, who were, we, who were we missing out on, and what are the implications of the representation that we were creating um, about, you know, the impacts on lives and livelihoods for action, right? Um, you know, who, who really does need to, to to get the, the data that we're, we're, um, we're trying to generate, what data should we be generating, et cetera. Uh, and all of these 
um, are of course driven by values, but I think it brings me back to one of the, the really key insights. And I guess as a, you know, employee of philanthropy, underscored the importance of diversity of voices and a diversity of actors and a diversity of um, you know, positionality in the research space, because we had both sort of, you know, academic researchers sitting in universities in the US and all over India, but we also had civil society groups. You know, we had a group called Jan Sahas that works with migrant laborers and they actually implemented one of the most brilliant research projects that have been done ever in my view, you know, where they um, used all of the, the contact information that they had with migrant workers to in real time actually capture what was going on and were able to actually signal this, you know, impending disaster as people were migrating back to their homes in rural areas. So, you know, they, I think it really underscored for me the importance of, you know, ensuring that evidence generation uh, the capacity to generate data and evidence is, you know, highly diversified. It's not something that we, you know, it's important for us to not just accumulate those skills um, and opportunities just within academia, that it's really important to get those skills um, and provide or, you know, off facilitate those opportunities for a very diverse set of actors. Over. But yeah, uh, so building up on that as well, and especially for the nature of representation, right? So um, one of the things that we're, we do as modelers is try to make choices about what and what not to represent in, in these models. And um, that is something that is really, really important to critically reflect on. And it's something that often gets slipped underneath, right? Like the model just gets presented as if it's this beautiful result and the assumptions that went into it are not exposed. And those who aren't trained in modeling and maybe some policymakers who aren't, don't recognize that aspect of model building, sometimes are tempted to then take those things, those model results off the shelf, inform policies, and don't realize that that very process can actually create a certain kind of feedback loop where the, the results of the policy can actually then confirm the model results. So as an example of this, I think it was Kathy O'Neill wrote this in her book, um, Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, did all these analyses of these various policies that were informed on certain models of like recidivism, for example, to decide on how long you want to uh, uh, put someone in prison for, right? Um, and it turns out that a lot of these models, uh, because the policies that are connected with them, end up reinforcing each other in a way that sort of actually amplifies some of the initial assumptions that went into what those models were, which led to, you know, further inequality as opposed to trying to deal with uh, certain inequalities, especially in the United States. So I, I think picking up on some of the things that Jonathan was, was pointing out is rather than trying to have some kind of simple answer a strategy that says this is the best model is becoming comfortable with the fact that no models give you a piece of information they give you a pu this puzzle piece right but the puzzle that we're trying to put together is really complex and trying to develop an awareness of those hidden assumptions that go into the models and being comfortable with the complications that come with that I think is uh, perhaps one strategy to, to, to try to inform policymakers or, or something that policymakers could do to, to recognize the sort of bad sides of, uh, of what comes out of using models. Please go ahead. Uh, can I go ahead? So just yeah. one point to add to that, but so many of the discussions we've been having more recently in, in various groups is precisely around this question of how do you communicate uncertainty to policymakers? And that's what Bert alluded to just now. And I think that's extremely important because scientists are not trained to do that. But you know, you, we have a theory. We, well, okay, they're trained to do that, but they don't explain these things very well. So, what exactly are the limits to which you should trust a predictor? Where are the where are the holes in the argument? Where are the loopholes? What is the li lower limit you can expect? What is the upper limit you can expect? I think again, that's that's a sort of broader question that philosophers can can do a lot. People who think about ethics of in communication can really help scientists in the business of policy communications to think about. It's interesting uh, that you point this because in one of the coming sessions, probably we're going to have this in, uh, in more detail. Uh, Don, you have something to say uh, to this. 
yeah, this will just be brief, but um, you know, one thing that struck me um, throughout the pandemic, and this gets to kind of science communicating, not just to policymakers, but to the public, is how much we've relied upon numbers and projections and predictions. I mean, I could, I could find, I could call up, you know, 10 different predictions about different countries in the world now just by Googling over a, a period of seconds, really. Um, and I think there's a kind of risk here um, that by communicating all of these numbers and predictions, we give the impression to the public and perhaps perhaps also policymakers, but that's something I'm less, I'm less sure about, that really the decision comes down to just a numbers game, right? Which number, under which scenario the number is the lowest? And all the, all the work and all the burden just is, is on coming up with an accurate prediction and, and it takes the form of a certain number or perhaps range of numbers with a certain associated uncertainty. And then the job is kind of done. And we've had a lot of what you might call openness or transparency about predictions. I mean, you can just find them out there. I can, I can even go and compare different models of what they, and what they have to say right now online. Um, but we haven't had as much transparency around decision-making, at least in some countries. So, you know, what has actually gone on behind closed doors when powerful states have decided the fate of their, of their people? I mean, what are all the considerations that they've used in order to make a decision? Some countries have been more transparent about this than others. I'm a little bit in the dark around, for instance, the United States, why early on certain decisions were made. Um, there was a task force ap appointed by the federal government and um, and to my mind, anyway, the kind of decision making that was going on there wasn't as transparent. But contrast this to um, the United Kingdom, which relies on a scientific advisory group for emergencies, whose meeting minutes are, are actually public and published soon after those meetings. That's not to say that, that the minutes of those meetings represent all of the factors that go into decision making. I'm sure there's lots that goes on behind closed doors that we're not purview to. But by kind of seeing behind the, some of these closed doors and, and looking at the kinds of decision-making processes that go on, you know, I at least have, have uh, acquired a new appreciation for how, at least in some cases, certain policy groups or government bodies make decisions when faced with all this uncertainty and faced with all these possibilities. Um, there are many different ways, many different heuristics or frameworks to use to make a decision, and different groups might, might rely on different heuristics or frameworks. Uh, and unfortunately, that we haven't, there, was an, there was, hasn't always been absolute transparency around the decision-making process, what kind of considerations groups are using, and why they've chosen the routes that they have. Uh, but that kind of transparency is just as important as this transparency in modeling predictions, which surely isn't you know, all that we need in order to make these weighty and important decisions. Great. Uh, I think it has been a really wonderful uh, time talking to all of you. We have come to know uh, so much about uh, uh, model themselves, but also the, the uncertainties that lie because of the assumptions that go into them and how they can be used to inform public policy. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, uh, in the chat and also some people had raised their hands earlier. So uh, I would ask uh, them to uh, probably uh, put their questions I'll call them out. And in case you have the panelists, you have questions for each other, we'd be happy to have uh, you present to each other as well. So the first question we had was from Tarun. Uh, Tarun, if you are here, you just unmute yourself then. Hi, yeah, thanks, Sarsh. Um, uh, first of all, thank you all for a really fascinating and wide ranging uh, discussion. Um, uh, I guess I have a, a slightly simple minded question, which is um, about, uh, so uh, Gautam had shown, uh, for example, um, a model uh, uh, about hospitalizations in Pune, I think, and uh, how that matched up to the actual data. And it seemed to actually do pretty well, uh, the model in uh, predicting how hospitalizations move. Um, and so I was wondering to what extent have we been able to, now that we're sort of a year uh, away from the beginning of the pandemic, to what extent have we been able to uh, validate some of the assumptions that were made in the models that initially were used uh, to make predictions about the pandemic. And, and have there been certain, especially in the Indian context, have there been certain surprises that really were very different from what the model suggested or is it too early to tell? If that's addressed to me, that's a mean, mean question. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I think we now know much more about 
the numbers for India that are appropriate in terms of now we can do, we have Bombay, Delhi, we have multiple states, etc. So we can see, do these numbers make sense relative to each other? Did they fail? Here's one great example where they failed. Pretty much every epidemiologist working in India would have predicted that by this, by November of last year, across November and December, you would have seen an increase in cases. It's it's winter, which is the, the festival season in in over all of the north, so Diwali. It's the wedding season over all of the north. It's also the puja season in between between Bengal and, and sort of parts surrounding Bengal. So. If you had asked, that's the time when people go out, they meet, they're in enclosed places, they're in large numbers. And you know, even the, even the sort of picture that you saw in the newspapers on those days had people with large numbers of people outside. That didn't happen. And that, for me, is the biggest epidemiological surprise of all. Why didn't we see an increase of cases at that time, as well as for many other people who think about modeling in India? So that's where I think models fail to predict that. Maybe we didn't understand Maybe these were people who were outside, not inside. They were wearing masks and that wasn't adequately put into the model. All of these things could happen. So models are getting better. I think we will do the next pandemic better than we've done this pandemic, if that's any consolation. But there are many things that we didn't understand and we didn't get right. Uh, you're muted, Abhishek. Yeah. We have a question from someone named Seven. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I do not know your name, so I'll just read the question. Uh, in case you want, you can also unmute yourself and speak. Uh, so uh, the guest asks, tells out that we have no models. Uh... Oh, wait. I wonder if this is a question or a comment, but I'll read it out nonetheless. Uh, they type out that we have no models on all on post immunization morbidity in antiviral mass adult vaccinations, especially nothing at known about the genotoxicity of RNA based vaccines. Because once you choose fast track route, these concerns uh, are just aside for shorter gains. Uh, so probably what they could be asking is about how much we know about these vaccinations and uh, do we know enough to act on them? Anybody from the panel probably can this. This particular question should perhaps be asked to Gagandeep Kang in the following session because she's the expert on this particular area. Yes, I suppose I suppose that is that is how we should. So probably uh, they would have a, a better uh, answer for this, uh, a more qualified expert to answer this question in the in the next session. Uh, we also have a question from Daniel, and then I'll come to Mike. Uh, Daniel asks that in times like this, how do we prevent that the decision of important policies are as least politicized as possible? Uh, I guess I'll take the bait. Uh, <laughs> I... I think part of the answer is going to depend on what we mean by at least politicized. As we sort of had talked about before, politics by its very nature is the aggregation of values. And to some extent, we're, you know, when we're making certain decisions, that's a reflection on what we think is important for various parts of the population. Um, but I, there's another sense of a politicized when people might use pieces of information as a way to elevate themselves into power or to, to create what we think are sort of ethically questionable situations. Um, and in that sense, I, I think that's, that's very, it's, that's a really difficult question about how do we prevent something like that? Um, uh, I don't know. Sorry, that basically was a, a an answer of I don't know. I'm not sure how to do that ideally, but maybe Jonathan has something to add to that. Okay, let's hear from Donovan. Yeah, so I'll just point to some interesting work that others are doing that I haven't really been participating in. So um, I agree that there's different ways of understanding this question. Um, you know, in, in some sense, policy is about politics, but I take it the question is really asking, how do we avoid a politically polarized discourse and decision-making in which we've seen played out in some countries. Um, that's a very general question. Um, in other words, you know, it's, it's aggravated in a context like a pandemic when the stakes are high. But the fact is that we have seen 
a polarization um, of beliefs and communities creeping along for some time now. And that's led some people, some social scientists and even some philosophers who use um, tools of social sciences in order to try to understand what leads to political polarization of beliefs. So there's some interesting work that in fact uses the insights from network modeling to understand how isolate communities that are epistemically isolated, in other words, that tend to share and trust one another within that community and systematically distrust those from other communities, how those form, how they're reinforced, how we might be able to break those up and how we might be able to infiltrate them with good public health imaging. And insights from that research are still ongoing. I think it's an emerging area and a very interesting one. Um, but I think you know one thing that's that we've seen is that community or that one insight that's been generated by this research is that certain knowledge communities, what have been called by some philosophers belief factions, can form along ideological, political, um, or value-driven lines, and these insulated communities can then become a, a network for sharing information that might appear to be quite, in the face of it, politically neutral. Um, one interesting example that uh, Kaylin O'Connor and Jim Weatherall from the University of California, Irvine have written about is hydroxychloroquine, which is just this anti-malarial drug that you know, seemingly that we shouldn't have a particular political affiliation to over something like um, remdesivir. And yet it has become this locus for politicization. How exactly does that happen? Well, we can, we can look at this question in particular contexts and trace the kind of history of how something like hydroxychloroquine came to be associated with certain um, you know, conservative or right-leaning political ideologies in certain countries. And, and I think to do that, we can use some of these tools of network modeling or even insights from the social sciences around how communities form around um, and how they come to trust one another and so on. And, and actually it serves as a very interesting case study around um, how certain communities can, can come to believe certain things. And then the more difficult question, which I think is the one that we still don't have a great answer to, how do we prevent this from happening and how do we mitigate this problem when it arises so that we don't have different groups of people, you know, aligning themselves politically with things like face masks and hydroxychloroquine, which really shouldn't, shouldn't really have um, at least in the case of hydroxychloroquine versus some other drugs, shouldn't really have very strong political attachments, and yet it does. Um, understanding that is, I think, one of the more interesting and difficult challenges for people that work in the social space of knowledge in years to come. So uh, I, just to build on that quickly, uh, you know, there's quite a bit of research now happening in India uh, you know, through social media platforms, you know, to really understand. Uh, so it's very interesting. Some of the this interesting work that you're referencing, Jonathan, been done in the US in the context of the extreme polarization that we've seen there. Um, and, uh, you know, interesting. So there's both academic research, but also, you know, in the context of the pandemic, the government has also been looking at, and, you know, our current government is here in India's, um, a very uh, social media savvy government. Um, and so actually behavioral insights, um, you know, acquired through uh, analysis of social media plat data from social media platforms is being used, uh, for example, to combat misinformation and disinformation related to COVID-19 um, in the country. So it's, it's very interesting how, you know, sort of the whole digital communication landscape um, has um, altered the way, you know, we're thinking about um, policy communication uh, and management, uh, even in, in a country like India, or perhaps, you know, India is, I guess, at the forefront in a sense of the digital revolution, um, certainly across low and middle income countries. So I guess it's not surprising at all, uh, but it, it does raise some very interesting and I think at least for me, troubling questions around, you know, who actually has access to the, the, the data from those platforms? How are they being analyzed? You know, they could very easily be, you know, used in very particular ways, you know, weaponized in a sense. So I, again, I'm not a philosopher. I haven't 
thought through these from a philosophical point of view, but I think it, it's right for philosophical research in India. I think Jonathan and, and, and Sunita talked about the larger social context of polarization and how to track it. But for me, it's, it's a much more practical question and that would be just ensuring the independence of agencies, especially of regulatory agencies. We have a whole bunch of them in India, but whether they are sufficiently insulated, whether they, they can provide recommendations that are completely separate from the politics that surround them is something that we have to try, every country in the world has to try to do this. And I think that in a sense, even if you don't agree with the recommendation, if you believe that the people who made the recommendation are in a sense independent, that they've accommodated multiple views, that they're transparent, that you know who's gone into the committee, that will help a certain extent to making sure that, pol that the policy that you get is as, you know, as, 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 as um, sensitive to, to the actual requirements of the situation and not influenced by policy, by, by politics. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, I'll come back to Mike uh, if that's okay. Uh, but it's a question that was related to uh, what Sunita was saying. Uh, so, uh, again, pardon me for taking the number instead of Sunita. We have a question that uh, says many health related studies done on social media platforms do not seek institutional ethics committee approval. And also data sharing on some platforms like CTRA, etc. So, there is no approval sought beforehand. Uh, the question is, is this really an ethical practice? I put an answer into the chat box. Uh, basically say, I, you know, probably likely no. Um, it really depends on the terms on which the data were shared, you know, how the data were accessed by the researcher. Um, you know, the fact that many individuals who participate in social media platforms don't really understand the privacy policies, you know, it's all in very, very tiny letters and very, very long and dense. Um, so there's quite a lot of work going on in India around data governance and, you know, um, issues of, of, of data ownership, etc. Uh, there are groups um, such as the Data Governance Network. Uh, led by three institutions, um, IDFC and, and IPFP and IT for Change. Um, there are groups like the Apti Institute that are engaging very actively in dialogues um, on this issue. So I, I think that's a really good question and, and one that we've been sort of you know, popularizing within our um, core net within the COVID research network on the importance of um, you know, seeking ethics reviews. Thank you. Uh Mike, could you uh, ask a question? Sure, thanks. So this is this is an amazing discussion. I'm really enjoying this a lot. Um, I was thinking about maybe a question for Gautam. So we um, we have here a bunch of um, philosophy people, philosophy practitioners, students, philosophers, and one thing that philosophers of science um, need is more data about how the science is actually done. And we're thinking about um, governments that tell us, you know, follow the science, listen to the scientists. And I think a lot of the faith that people have in the science is in the bit of the models that is the kind of numerical dynamics that, that takes us from the input to the output. That's the bit that we can really put our faith in. Um, but as Jonathan was saying earlier, we have all these what philosophers call uh, non-epistemic values that are figuring into the decisions that, that make those dynamics. So I was just wondering if you could maybe say a bit more about how it's actually done on the ground so that philosophers can take this up and run with it about how exactly it is that you would you know, build, I mean, you don't build the model from the ground up. Presumably you take little bits and pieces that are already existing. Um, where do you take them from? How do you make decisions that involve both epistemic values, non-epistemic values? This is of course a big question, um, but if there's anything you could sort of say that could maybe help a lot of the philosophers of science who are listening here and who will listen later on with the YouTube link, uh, to try to get a grip on, on all of this, that I think would be amazing. And of course, Sunita, we'd be interested also in sociological models if, uh, if you have any thoughts on that too. So thanks. I, I can try and answer that in, in, in my own language. I mean, there, there are parts to how diseases move between people that we understand that are purely biological, that we could put numbers into, et cetera. So that's a part of the modeling that one can do without, re without reference at all to the people who are actually being diseased and to the patterns of interaction. That second part is the hard part. And I guess that's what you would call the non-epistemic part, where how do you model people's behavior? And this is something that Bert spoke about, that, that Jonathan spoke about. That is the hardest part in any of these models. 
How do you understand the interaction between people? What determines the decisions that people in, make individually? I spoke about agent-based models as a sort of, I said they're interesting because you can code reasons why people might make decisions and change them from time to time into such models, which you can't do with the other types of models, which give you pretty much a set answer. Or you can do it, but it's sort of, you don't get the sort of diversity that you would get in an agent-based model. For me, the agent-based models are interesting precisely because they, they reproduce that sort of ambiguity with which people make decisions, or the fuzziness with which you decide to do this or that, the fact that different people, even in the same household, can have different political persuasions and therefore different attitudes towards mask wearing. You can put it in at that level. And I think that thinking about agent-based models seems to me, although I don't know that any work has been done to be fertile territory for philosophers, because you can actually put in a lot of sort of, you can compare, you can run your model with different assumptions about what people might do, how people make decisions. And then ask, within that context, how do diseases spread? How do these decisions that people make change their social behavior and thereby change the way diseases transmit it? I'm not sure that's a good answer to the question. That's all I could come up with at this one. Yeah, that's okay. I think, Bert, uh, do you have something to add to this? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think there's at least two ways to, to help. Um, one is to, to just do it. Um, so there are some really great resources now um, that are friendly to people who don't have any programming backgrounds. So NetLogo, I think, is a great example of like, if you just want to get a feel for what agent-based modeling is like, even in a highly simplified case, do it, right? Uh, learn it to, to figure out like how many assumptions you have to make and how precise you have to be uh, to specify um, what's going on in the model. So just getting a little bit of like hands-on experience for it. And the second one is... Um, join a lab or a group like, like Gautam and just even just sit in on the conversations to hear about the kinds of conversations that are happening. I think that goes a long way for philosophers of science, uh, myself included, right, that, to learn about the ways that people talk, the kinds of assumptions that they're making. I think actually being on the ground and having that direct experience is one of the best things that we as philosophers of science can do to, to get that kind of important knowledge. Uh, so my Parting comment uh, in response to you, Mike, will be uh, 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 sort of a plea for more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, research and teams. I think we need to employ many different ways of knowing in order to uh, really better understand these kinds of dynamics. Uh, I think modeling and, and I, I met Josh Epstein shortly before the pandemic at, actually uh, at NYU and was super inspired by him and you know the agent-based modeling um, approach uh, and feel like that it is the one sort of quantitative approach that I think shows a lot of promise, but um, I have both quantitative and qualitative sort of research training and the medical anthropologist in me, you know, really also feels like we need to bring people's lived experiences and, you know, voices and so on into these discussions and into these research initiatives. And my hope is that we do um, much more team-based, uh, team science-based sort of work in this area in India as well, um, and, and, and really bringing together social scientists, philosophers, clinicians, et cetera, together. Um, and on that note, I have to sign off. Uh, really want to thank you all for inviting me into this conversation. As I said, I did feel like I was an interloper. Um, I, uh, I felt very, very, uh, you know, in tune with, with all of you. And it, it's been just a absolutely stimulating discussion. So thank you so much. That's been great having you here, I mean, we must say. Some of the insights that we got from you, like, uh, it's really good to have you here. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thanks everyone, good night. Have a good day. Okay, so, so Sunita had another meeting to join in some time, so she, uh, she could not stay till the end of it. Uh, but yeah, continuing from where she left, we have uh, John. Uh, he, his hand is raised and probably can circle back to Tarun. Well, I wanted to also just take a stab. Actually, not really to answer your question, Mike, but really just to emphasize its importance and its difficulty more than anything else, because I don't have a, an answer. I think it's a very important and difficult one. And I've, I've sort of been thinking about it lately myself. So I think I think there are two things that we might want to say. Um, on the one hand, we might want to emphasize, for instance, something that Gotham pointed out earlier, that it seems important that we have this group in society, scientists, who are in some sense independent of certain political interests. Um, and we do that by having 
bodies, agencies that um, that are in, in some sense um, separated from state. And it's also important that scientists themselves don't engage in something that I've heard cleverly called um, uh, policy-based science making. Um, this is where you kind of start with a kind of policy preference and you do science in such a way that maybe you are doing science that, that isn't quite um, in, in violation of the norms of science, but you're still doing science in such a way to get the answer out that you want. And it's possible to do this in some cases without doing science that falls fall short, uh, far short of uh, the standard of good standards for science, because there are so many different questions to ask, so many ways of analyzing something and so on. So I think we can recognize that these are important things, that we want some independence from politics, we want, we want to avoid policy-based science making. But then at the same time, uh, as a philosopher of science, I feel obligated to say that, of course, policies inevitably influence science at, at all the same. Um, so these, this is the fundamental tension that we want. We, we, I think many philosophers feel that values ultimately will influence scientific work. We might also want to avoid some of these cases in which values or political influ in, uh, interests influence it in a, in a way that we might think is bad. And so how do we do that? Um, and let me just let me just kind of motivate the problem a bit more, and then offer one very tentative uh, suggestion. So, I think the problem is is so deep and fundamental that we can't get rid of it. So, so in in various countries, we have academics who are um, not necessarily government contracted. They they are funded by by grants, and they have some flexibility and freedom to ask questions that they find um, scientifically interesting, but also important. So you might want to, let's say, model different um, ways of distributing the COVID-19 vaccines and the effects on some outcome like aggregate number of cases. Do we want to prioritize people who are at high risk and prevent death that way through uh, protecting individuals who are susceptible? Do we want to um, prioritize people who might be more um, likely to spread the disease and go for more a herd immunity approach? target transmission rather than individual susceptibility? Do we want to allocate vaccines um, such that certain communities or certain groups have higher priority, maybe those that are historically disadvantaged? Uh, what exactly do we do? Because we have all these choices in what to model, there's so much, we have so much flexibility and freedom as academic scientists um, who, who, might, who, who might have some responsibilities um, via the grants that they have, but still have a lot of intellectual freedom, inevitably certain values are going to come into play in what, what policies um, one chooses to model. Similarly, to get to the data point, you know, in order to answer certain questions with data, we have to choose which, what kinds of data we're going to collect in the first place. A very easy way to, to seemingly make um, inequities go away is to just not collect data on them. Then you won't see them and they won't be obvious and they won't be present to you. If we don't look, we won't find. So there's a kind of choice in what kind of data we want to, we, we decide to gather in the first place. And that choice is similarly has to be influenced by values. So on the one hand, values we can, we might, we might think might influence science in bad ways that we want to avoid, but on the other hand, we might think that they're inevitable. So how do we solve this problem? Well, again, I think this is a theme and what I've, I've been saying, I don't have a great answer, but I mean, one thing that we need to, to do when we're evaluating the quality of science is not just look at its validity and uh, reproducibility and all these other virtues, but we also have to look at its social value and its responsiveness to social needs. Um, one way this has not been done so well during the pandemic, uh, one example would be in the number of uncoordinated small um, clinical trials that have been run around the world to test this intervention or that intervention. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of sporadic, um, uncoordinated and sometimes low quality. What we really need is kind of coordinated research that's responsible to the needs of people. And then I think ideally is publicly funded uh, because we, we um, you know, even though they have their flaws, public bodies are the ones we, have to, we, we, can, we should rely on the most in order to uh, public and I'd actually also add philanthropic organizations rather than private ones are the ones we should rely on to kind of um, ultimately um, provide us with the kind of funding that might be responsive to social need. And then, and as I, as I just said, we need to evaluate the research with an eye, not to just not just to how um, reliable or high quality it is, but also whether it really answers the questions that we as a society 
um, value that it reflects the kinds of questions that we want to prioritize and not just the particular interests or more nefariously the, the particular um, you know political affiliation affiliations of those who are um, funding the science or doing the science I suppose that was comprehensive, comprehensive enough to uh, tackle Mike's question. Uh, Tarun has his hand raised, so probably we can hear the question from him. Uh, thanks. Um, so this is a question, I guess, uh, maybe specifically about agent-based modeling. So a uh, number of you have talked about it. So, um, and uh, so uh, I guess the deeper question I have is that there seem to be multiple things you can do with models, right? Uh, I think there's an assumption a lot of people have that when you're constructing a model, what the model is giving you is just a prediction, like a number or a range of numbers. And that is the purpose of the model to give you this number. And then you can know, make policy based on that number and so on. But there's, there are at least some disciplines where that's not the main aim of model, or at least some model. Right? A lot of the economic modeling is not about producing a number uh, or a prediction of that kind. It's about um, distinguishing or describing causal tendencies maybe. So you can play with aspects of the model to see what would happen in counterfactual situations. You're not committing yourself to the claim that the exact number you get out at the end is correct, but you have a kind of sense of the tendency. Uh, if you change certain behavioral assumptions, how does that change certain overall features of the outcome? Um, and uh, so I was wondering whether um, that kind of modeling takes place in epidemiology as well. Is that useful from a policy perspective? And uh, initially, when I hear of agent-based modeling, I, I guess my assumption is that that is what's going on in agent-based modeling. Uh, and is that correct? Or is agent-based modeling really also just trying to give you a number? Uh, I guess. I guess. I, I can, can I start with that? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so for me, part of it is what you said, that can you explore counterfactuals? and ask what would have been the different consequences of policy at different times. I look at much of this modeling is really useful insofar as it helps you think about policy a little better because finally that's what influences human beings and human lives and, and you know sort of rather than just a dull mathematical problem, it actually has the real world reference. And the more you trust your models to say something sensible with modulo all of the uncertainty inside that, the more useful they are for that particular type of decision. But the second thing as which I think reflects my training as a physicist is that I, like to look for things that are what are called emergent behavior. And if I have a complicated model with many interacting little pieces in there, there's always the possibility of surprise of things that you didn't anticipate in the construction of the model coming out because you have these many units interacting together. Emergent behavior, I think, is the most significant aspect of models like, like agent-based models. That possibility isn't really there in the other types of models which give you predictable answers. But the moment, as we know from physics, from, from a whole bunch of other types of studies, the moment you have many things interacting together, even with very simple interactions, the net behavior that you can take and have a complexity that you do not even anticipate is not even contained in those levels of, in those individual objects. That I think is an important feature of thinking about models like this that is not sufficiently stressed in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great answer. So uh, in addition to what Gautam was just saying with an epidemiology, so philosophers will often use agent-based models to study various kinds of emergent behaviors as well. So I've done a bunch of work in trying to understand how echo chambers and political polarization emerge out of um, individual choices, right? So you model individuals, you think about how they might spread their opinions, how those choices get made. And then you look to see whether at an, an aggregate level, whether you see something like an echo chamber or, or polarization. And the goal is typically not to just get like some type of output number, but you're looking for qualitative patterns that might depend on what's going on at the micro or individual level. Um, and so in the case of epi epidemics, right, I think there's some really interesting feedback loops that are harder to capture with some standard sort of compartmental models where people's behaviors in response to the epidemic, right, is going to change. So there was a great example before when we were talking about um, looking at how many lives were saved, and it depends on what the comparison class is, right? You have some policy, and the contrast is if we didn't do the policy and everybody behaved normally, what would happen in terms of like the number of lives lost? But it's kind of ridiculous to think that people aren't going to individually respond to the to the epidemic, right? If I see a whole bunch of people getting sick in my city, 
I'm not going to keep going out to the grocery store. Lots of people are going to, without a policy, change their behaviors. And so there's really complicated feedback loops that, that happen that are difficult to, to capture, but can be captured in a more natural way with agent-based models. And then you just explore what those are. So I sometimes think about agent-based models in at least this more simplified form as really sophisticated thought experiments where you've had to say more precisely about how agents are going to interact. And so I think there's an interesting place in between, right? You've got the synthetic populations like what Gautam works on, which are sort of like really, really high levels of granularity, but there's lots of in-between cases as well, depending on how, how much detail you want to put into your thought experiment. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in. So this is a, so th th these are great points and this is a really interesting philosophical question, something I've been thinking about lately. Um, so the one, I mean, we can even put, break it down to a couple of further questions. So the first thing is, are some or all of these epidemic models causal models, which philosophers, some philosophers of science um, have been used to thinking about? Well, sure, certainly we seem to treat some of these models as being causal models. And that's because we sometimes manipulate values of parameters in those models and then use that to predict the effect of certain policies. And seemingly one could only do that if the model itself was a causal model, because in order to, in order to say that we are predicting the effect of something by manipulating some variable, there has to be a causal relation between the variable that's changing and the one that we're, we're spitting out. So, you know, that gets to the nature of what some of these models are like. Is a compartment model a causal model? Is it a kind of mechanistic model? Does it represent the causal process by which um, a disease progresses. Um, it's a dynamical model, and some people have some, some philosophers have some worries about causation and dynamical models. So this actually raises all sorts of uh, really more kind of like bread and butter questions that philosophers have thought about, but I think are, are very interesting in this context. Um, the other thing, I mean, just a, one more point on this uh, on this topic. Uh, you know, we we sometimes we act as though when we're um, let's say taking a compartment model, manipulating it, and then generating some predictions. So what would happen under scenario A, scenario B? We're, we're acting as though we have made some sort of inference about the effectiveness of a, of a policy, let's say, or the effect size that we would expect uh, under one policy scenario versus another. I think this is a really interesting inference to analyze because in some sense, you might think that well, we can't possibly be generating new causal knowledge by doing that because all we're doing is manipulating information that's already contained within the model. On the other hand, you know, modelers themselves don't necessarily, aren't always able to predict what might happen when, especially with more complex models, what happens when you tweak variables. So on, that hand, on the other hand, it seems like you are perhaps learning new information by doing this. Okay, so that's a, a kind of thorny epistemological problem that kind of I find quite interesting. And I also want to say something briefly about the second part of what you suggested, uh, Taran, which is the, the counterfactual part. Um, and I know at least some behavioral scientists, epidemiologists draw a distinction between um, models that are more for forecasting versus models that are more for projecting, projection models. Forecasting is the kind of activity that we expect from you know, weather modelers when they tell us that tomorrow there's a 30% chance of rain. When we're projecting, on the other hand, we're just talking about a hypothetical scenario. If we make certain assumptions, if certain things obtain, then something else will follow. We've certainly done a lot of projecting in the pandemic. And we know that because those projections sometimes involve a counterfactual comparison. They involve two scenarios that are just mutually incompatible. Um, do we lock down the entire country or do we do nothing? We can't do both at the very same time. So therefore, one of these things must run counter to fact. It must be counterfactual. So these models have to be then counterfact capable of generating counterfactuals if we're using them to make this kind of comparison. On the other hand, though, when people are evaluating these models, at least sometimes they've acted as if they're forecasting models by saying, hey, look, the model spit out a range of numbers, and these numbers didn't match up to reality. Therefore, the model is unreliable. But that's a fundamental mistake if you are evaluating um, a projection model and evaluating a counterfactual. I think there, it's very difficult to, to even think about what the truth of a counterfactual is for, from a philosophical perspective. But I think one thing that we, we can say for certain is that um, it's wrong to hold up and judge a counterfactual uh, according to whether or not it's consequent obtains, whether or not it's prediction obtains, if the antecedent, the assumptions are far removed from reality. 
Uh, but some people have made mistakes in doing that. I think there's an even deeper question here, though, as to whether there's really ever a sense in which a model should be thought of as a forecasting model, as generating unconditional predictions. And that's because even if we don't attach those assumptions or antecedents to that prediction when we're presenting it, seemingly the, those predictions always are based on certain assumptions that are built into the structure of the model or the values of the parameters imputed. So I've sort of wondered myself around whether or not this distinction between projection models and forecasting ones, what it actually amounts to, um, and whether, for instance, really we should be talking about forecasting versus projecting at the level at which model users present those predictions. I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it is a kind of uh, one that connects to all sorts of problems that philosophers of science have, have been thinking about. Thank you for that detailed response, John. That was really great. Uh, we have more questions. Uh, unfortunately, we seem to have run out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank all the panelists, and including Smita, who is not here, for taking time out uh, and joining us for this discussion. Uh, in case anyone uh, has a question, uh, we would like them to, we would ask them to take those questions to the panelists. Uh, Sahana has put their uh, uh, email IDs and other contact details on chat. So you could reach out to them directly. You can send a mail to them with the questions. And uh, that was it for today's session. Uh, the next session uh, is on 26th. Uh, we'd like to have you there as well. And uh, I guess with that, uh, I would uh, thank you all again for being here and have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice to see you, Jonathan. Yeah, good to see you too, Bert. And thanks a lot, Abhishek, and everyone for organizing. That was yeah, uh, thank you terrific. so much. This enjoyed, was... it, enjoyed it very much. Yeah, thanks. This was thanks. fantastic. We hope to do this uh, this probably uh, more regularly, more people. And, and frankly, this uh, one of